Welcome to episode 107 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast, the spring upgrade episode. I'm Chris and joining me is Shane. We are amateur astronomers who love looking up at the night sky. And this podcast is for anyone else who likes going out under the stars. So Shane, this will be, um, you know, a, a conversation about, uh, you know, about upgrades that people can do. It's sort of like a, like a common theme in the forums. Um, sometimes it's a common question uh, that we get from from listeners, but like, you know, maybe this is going to be the year that somebody's looking to upgrade from their achromatic refractor to an APO, or they're looking to get some wide field eyepieces, or maybe like in Shane's case, looking to get some narrow Zeiss eyepieces or, or something like that. Yeah, you know, that's one of the kind of neat things with the hobby. Um, there's there's no end of like potential upgrades and things you can do to improve either your comfort or the views through your telescope. Um, so I think it'll be kind of neat for you and I to just maybe talk about either upgrades we would like to do or upgrades we've done and just opinions and things of that nature. Yeah. So this, this particular episode was really inspired by a recent email um, we received. Like often we get a ton of email during the week. And we'd love to hear from listeners. Um, this past week, we didn't receive as many, but we, what, what we lacked in uh, quantity uh, was made up for in, in the quality of Sean's email that he, that he sent us. Um, so this is a listener email by Sean. Shane, would you, would you care to read this? Sure. So, um, so Sean writes, hi, Shane and Chris. Uh, I came across your podcast a couple of months ago, and I love it. Uh, I bought my first telescope around June or July when Neo Wise was naked eye. I think it was a Mead 50 millimeter or 60 millimeter refractor that I purchased for $100 used. When I pointed it at Jupiter and Saturn, I was hooked and the obsession began. Uh, I've made significant upgrades since then and now have a Skywatcher 10 inch Dobsonian for observing and an Orion ED80 doublet on a Sirius EQG mount for imaging. Uh, just over a week ago, I listened to episode number 94. Uh, I didn't know about the wall feature and had planned on observing and imaging the moon the following day. Uh, looking back at my images, I was happy to see I captured the wall and wanted to share it with you guys. Uh, thanks for sharing your knowledge, and I'll keep listening as long as you keep putting out the podcast. Cheers, uh, Sean. Uh, so he's referring to the the lunar uh, the lunar wall. It's uh, yeah. one of the many features on the moon that you know you you have to time it just right to see it. It's pretty phenomenal. It's like you know to the to the visual eye, it just looks like a real straight line across uh, a crater. Um, but yeah, you know, interesting how he started out with uh, you know a modest refractor and then made some real big jumps with a you know a pretty good sized Dobsonian and then a uh, you know a real nice uh, ED refractor for uh, imaging. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and again uh, for me, thanks so much, Sean. I appreciate your your email. Um, really did enjoy it. I read it several times, and and we end up deciding to do a whole episode. Um, in this light, because I, I actually think what Sean did here is, is in many ways kind of like the perfect thing. Um, so I know there's a lot of people who are really interested both in, in looking at the sky and looking at um, galaxies and nebulas and planets and different things for themselves. As well, I know there's an increasing interest in, uh, in doing astrophotography. So uh, I'm thinking that Sean probably did quite a bit of research because I think he probably bought pretty much like a perfect set here. Um, for somebody that that has determined that they have a real interest, and uh, and so he he started off with a with an inexpensive uh, instrument, and uh, and then determined his interest was there, and, and probably did quite a bit of research um, because I think like a ten inch daub and an eighty millimeter uh, apochromat, um, you know, an affordable uh, eighty millimeter apochromat doublet. Um, is really, really a, a beautiful combination. The 10 inch daub really will pull in tons of light, really be able to start to see structure in galaxies and, and uh, really resolve those globular clusters. And then the, the ED80, although I think he's primarily using it for imaging, um, even if you don't want to use it for imaging, I mean, it makes a great uh, smaller secondary telescope. Um, we've talked a lot about 80 millimeter uh, range telescopes and that, that's a nice size telescope. It's small, um, but it's just on the verge of where small telescopes start feeling big. 
um, but definitely still uh, portable and you can mount on a variety of different things. Serious EQG mount. That's a serious mount. Uh, you know, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it like those are big, those are big mounts. And uh, I think they're, they're relatively affordable. I think this is all, is, I can't remember if the serious is a, is an, oh, must be an Orion product. Yeah. I think similar yeah. one, um, from Skywatcher. And there's also similar uh, 80 millimeters from, from Skywatcher uh, too, if you're, if you're not in a place where you can get uh Orion instruments. So I, I thought that made a really good uh, upgrade. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts, Shane? I thought he did a, a, a great job, perfect job in upgrading from uh, a telescope for testing the waters to getting into good gear. What are your thoughts? Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, the, this, the beginner scope that he had of uh, the Mead 50 or 60 millimeter um, really does show quite a bit. Um, you'll see detail on Saturn and, uh, and Jupiter and, and, you know, the list goes on from there. Um, but a 10 inch Dobsonian, like that's a serious instrument that'll really provide some outstanding views of deep sky objects. Um, and I, I used to have an 80 millimeter, uh, William optic ED refractor, uh, that was outstanding. And, um, an interesting thing I just read, uh, the other day too, was it's the first three inches of aperture really matter because the first three inches of aperture add about four magnitudes to your vision, right? You're able to see four magnitudes hmm. fainter to see the next four magnitudes fainter. You have to go to 23 inches of aperture. So, so, you know, the first wow. three inches is, is important and, um, it allows you to yeah. see all kinds of things and an 80 millimeter refractor, um, you know, on a big mount like that is perfect for astrophotography. You should always overmount your astrophotography telescope to try to minimize some of the errors that will come through your, your photographs. And an 80 millimeter refractor can, can do all sorts of magic on the night sky with a camera attached to it. Um, you know, a lot of great astro images are captured with 80 millimeter refractors. Uh, they do an outstanding job. Um, in fact, you know, there's a bit of a, a trend right now for the, the William optic red cat. Uh, I think it's like a 50 millimeter or maybe it's 60. I'm not sure. Yeah. It's, it's a small refractor that people 51. are doing some outstanding. Yeah. yeah. People are doing some outstanding imaging with those things too. So, um, you know, imaging, you don't necessarily need the largest aperture for that. So, uh, yeah, great, great combo. And, and the nice thing too, is that ED refractor, um, while it sounds like Sean is using that primarily for imaging, it's a, a grab and go telescope, um, you know, uh, maybe an alt yep. as mount, uh, so that you can just take it out the door and, and, uh, you know, be easier to pack than, uh, the 10 inch and quicker to set up. So for those quick sessions, it's pretty hard to beat, uh, in a, you know, a three inch refractor. Yeah. And I, and there's, uh, there's an individual who's, who's attended my class recently. Um, I think, I think he also kind of did a similar, um, upgrade when he was getting into it, where he went to one of these uh, ED eighties as they're, as they're lovingly called, um, which are kind of like about the most affordable um, sort of higher quality uh, 80 millimeter telescope. And I've looked through lots of them. They're great instruments, really, really nice instruments. And I really think that the difference between those um, 80 millimeter scopes and, uh, and the very best ones is uh is hair splitting at best. And really what, what you're getting into in more expensive instruments often is just um, more like accessory uh, differences than necessarily. Like you're, you're not going to have this, uh, you know, completely different, uh, different view or, or different experience. Uh, and as well, like some of the 80 millimeters like yours uh, that you have, Shane, is uh, quite a bit lighter, uh, for example. But, um, but yeah, I mean, th these are going to give you uh, most of, of what you're going to get in any telescope. Oh, for sure. In fact, in some regards, you're, you're probably getting a little bit more on the accessory side, you know, like my 76 millimeter came with a single speed focuser and nothing else. Whereas when you buy one of these ED refractors, you're probably getting a, like a dual speed Crayford focuser. In some cases, it's probably a rotating focuser, which is a nice benefit yep. if you're on an EQ mount. Uh, so, you know, you're like my William optic, uh, came with a red dot finder, uh, I think it even came with a diagonal, you know, like a two inch diagonal. Mm. So you're, you're getting usually, uh, you know, kitted out quite nicely with one of those. And, and as you mentioned, Chris, the, the price, price is all relative, you know, in this hobby, you know, like anything else in life, but um, they're, they're quite well priced in my opinion, when you compare it to some of the other options out there. 
Yeah, like I mean, if you're tuning into our super yacht podcast, that we all—I'm just kidding, we don't. <laughs> you know, like, like it, it all—it all depends. Like some people who are into—I uh, remember when I was much younger, I, I ended up uh, one of my first big purchases was getting like a tiny little sailboat. My my uncle built sailboats, and and I had to have one. Um, and uh, and yeah, even at that age, like I mean, these are expensive things. Like probably, um, you know, more expensive than telescopes for sure um you know so it's all it's all kind of relative in as 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 to what you're into and you can do this for not a whole lot of money uh really there's uh lots of people who just uh, look at the sky with uh pretty uh modest equipment uh or equipment they made but Shane let's let's go in this direction I, I don't have any any notes um per se uh in this direction but I'm wondering I was going to ask you like what what your like first telescope upgrade was maybe that's not the right question I mean, maybe it is, but but maybe it's not. So maybe I'm going to make it more open than that. What what's sort of the the one thing or your first thing that you you upgraded from and to where you, where you were you were doing astronomy and you were you know going about your way and and uh, on your on your astronomical journey and you went hmm this is where I want to go this th- this is why I want this or whatever. So what what is sort of like that one thing you think of? when it comes to uh, astronomy gear and upgrading um, that kind of sticks out in, in your mind, at least for your astronomical journey? Um, good question. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you two things, but they're both kind of related to the same topic. Uh, so the two things are uh, maybe first I'll say it was on my eight inch Skywatcher Dubsonian. Um, and the two real uh, upgrades that stand out in my mind um, are, are related to fun- things. So one was the finder. Um, and then the other was a uh, wide field eyepiece. So when I got my eight inch Dobsonian, it came with a couple standard plossels. You know, I, I don't remember probably a 10 millimeter and a 25 millimeter or something, uh, of, of that nature. Um, my first real upgrade mm-hmm. though, actually was getting, uh, just replacing those plossels with, uh, some brand name plossels, uh, at the time, uh, the Mead 4,000 plossels were well regarded. So, uh, I bought a number of those and, and, and observed a lot with them. But to be honest, I didn't find like a big difference between those and um, uh, the plossels that came with my telescope. Uh, so the next thing that I bought was a, a wide field eyepiece. And I think it was like a 10 or four, I think it was a 14 millimeter Spears Waller, uh, which is a, a Canadian made eyepiece. I see you. I think this is one of your early upgrades too, but um, I was yeah. truly blown away. You know, going from a 50 millimeter plossel to uh, something like an 80, uh, or, uh, sorry, a 50 degree plossel uh, to uh, like an 80 degree wide field eyepiece just blew my mind with how much more I could see, uh, which made finding things easier. So, you know, that's kind of related to my theme. Uh, but also on an undriven mount, I could just observe things for a much longer period of time before I had to nudge the telescope, which was really, really nice. Um, so the other thing that I did on that telescope, um, was by a Telrad and, uh, uh, I just found uh, the, like it came with a straight through seven by 50 finder, which was literally a pain in the neck to look through. Like it, mm-hmm. it you know, it was physically uncomfortable and you're a taller um, person. So I think yeah. for me, that wasn't as big a deal, but yeah, you're a taller person. So you've got to bend even further. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I didn't enjoy it. So uh, I, I put a Telrad on there and a right angle, uh, correct image finder. So the right angle finder, just, you know, immensely more comfortable. Yeah. Um, and then the Telrad allowed me to just point the, the whole telescope at the, you know, the thing in the sky real quickly. And then I could use the finder to narrow, narrow down, uh, where I wanted to look, but all of that combined really stood out. Uh, and it still stands out in my memory as to how much it changed my observing it made me, it allowed me to enjoy my sessions a lot more. And I was finding more objects. I was seeing more things. Um, so those ones really, really stand out, uh, hmm. you know, early on in my, you know, hobby days. How about you? What, uh, what's some of your memorable first upgrades? Yeah. Uh, almost like, you know, and it's funny cause, cause, uh, I think you, you were, you were out here at least in this general area. Um, in Saskatchewan and there I am on the other side of the country um, I think just a few years before I think I, I started this just two or three years before you did or something like that anyway 
And uh, yeah, almost exactly the same story. You know, I, I had, uh, I bought an eight inch daub, but it didn't really come with any eyepieces. It can, maybe it came with one and it was, um, uh, I don't want to insult you, but it, I was going to say it was a Kellner and I know you, you're, you're using Whoa. some of these really high, high end Kellners the, now. Them be fighting words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but this, this was not a great one. In fact, oh. I, I think I end up throwing it out when we <laughs> of our moves and I'll tell you why because the glass had fogged over so bad and it seemed like the glass was kind of foggy even when I got it. So I don't know whether it was just a flaw in that particular eyepiece, but uh, I'm not going to go on too, too much about it. So what I did when I was ordering this and, and I'd heard that the eyepiece wasn't great uh, that came with it is I, I ordered um, a couple Teleview Plossels. I ordered the 32 and then I ordered the 11. Uh, and then I had a Barlow, a two times Teleview Barlow, and I still have that Barlow. It's, it's okay. And so then uh, by using that Barlow, I would have a 32, a 16, an 11, and like a five and a half, which is uh, a pretty nice range for a 1200 millimeter telescope. Pretty much uh, most, most things would be covered there. Um, but what, what, they, what they lacked a little bit um, was field of view, you know, and of course this is um, during the time when uh, Naglers and the type one Naglers or 82 degree eyepieces um, from meat as well are becoming all the rage. And then, uh, and then as well, I found that the eye relief on the 11 millimeter um, was very tight. And so I just wasn't really using it that much. Um, and then uh, what I end up doing is going to some of these Spears Waller eyepieces that had 70 degree fields of view and they actually had decent eye relief. So the eye relief was, was okay. Like I could use them see, I think they were like 70 degrees and I estimated I was getting close to that with my glasses on, not ideal, but it was good. And then um, very soon after, and this is when you get into the hobby is, uh, is they released 80 degree versions. And so I ended up selling off my 70 degree versions and buying the 80 degree versions. Um, and I had a real disappointing discovery and that's that the 80 degrees I had to use with my glasses off and I have astigmatism. And so that wasn't great. So I was kind of surprised that, you know, here I was, I, I had done my first real upgrade and uh, I think I, I had made a mistake and I kind of had wished to have the old uh, 70 degree versions over the eighties because they, they just worked better for me. Um, so that was kind of surprising. Um, so you sort of have to make sure, and, and it's a little bit easier now to do research and talk to people on cloudy nights or other astronomy forums and, and read reputable, uh, reviews and that sort of thing. But you can kind of uh, make a gaffe like I did and go to some eyepieces that, that might not work, uh, as well. In fact, I was chatting with Glenn Spears, uh, at the, at the last star party before the pandemic who makes these and, and he actually had his new eyepieces out there, which I think are 86 degree or something. And I said, oh, but I wear glasses. He's like, yeah, you don't want those. <laughs> you know, like, so he wasn't even trying to convince me to go with, to go with them now. So, uh, and that was right from the manufacturer. But around that time, I was out observing at our, at our uh, club observatory one night and a fellow member showed up with uh, some of these Pentax XL eyepieces. And I looked hmm. through those. And so here I had my 80 degree eyepieces thinking that I pretty much had as wide a field as, as you could go. And uh, so the maximum enjoyment you could have. And then I found that I actually enjoyed looking through these pentaxes, which were only 65. So not even as wide as my first upgrade. So they weren't mm -hmm. even 70 degrees. And I just couldn't get over the fact that I liked an eyepiece that just wasn't really even being, uh, remotely cutting edge as far as the as the field of view went and so i thought well you know why why is this and it turns out that the pentax at least for me anyway when you're wearing glasses are among the most comfortable eyepieces so then when pentax released their 70 degree versions i just had to have them because you get the whole field it's easy to see and blah 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 and now there's lots of eyepieces out there um, that kind of meet those similar criteria for those of us that, that wear glasses or want long eye relief for one reason or another. Um, and so that's something to, to consider when you're looking to, to upgrade your, your eyepieces is 
not just the field of you and and I know uh, with all the hundred or hundred and ten degree eyepieces out there these days, people get really hung up on that field of view. But if it's not comfortable or you have to take your glasses off um, and you're getting uh, aberrations because you're not wearing your glasses now, you've you've kind of just um, you know circumvented the the whole reason to to go with those. But you know everybody's everybody's a little bit different. And then the other uh, upgrade I did like you was the finder scope. I went, I, I had bought a Telra, which is a zero power finder. I talked about that in the last episode. And then I upgraded to the eight by 50, um, university optics, um, a Misi correct image diagonal. Um, but then again, I, I ran into some difficulties because it was so heavy and on the Dobsonian, I had to mount it so low. It was super awkward to use. Um, so again, uh, one of my first upgrades, uh, didn't go as well. And then even still like trying to mount that on uh, other telescopes, uh, has, has proven difficult just due to the weight. Um, so it is something to, to keep in mind. And even like this week, I've been playing around with the Borg and trying to get that set up as, as a finder scope. And I sent you an image and it looks great in the image. Like, and you were like, wow, that looks amazing, but it won't work like the, the physical nature of it. It's too tail heavy. So it's that that's not going to work yet. So we're still working on that. So, mm-hmm. all right. Mm-hmm. I'll turn, turn yeah. Back I, I had some, ba- <laughs> I, yeah, I had some balance issues too uh, on my eight inch daub. And one of the other kind of uh, do it yourself upgrades that I did um, was I got just, uh, I think they were like two pound weights or two and a half pound weights, like for, for weightlifting, but just the, uh, the plate. Um, mm-hmm. And then I put some rare earth magnets. I glued them on to the plate. And then I, you know, I could just stack these weights on the back of the telescope to counterbalance it. Uh, because the other thing too, like one of my other upgrades, you know, kind of, you're just, at least me, I find I'm constantly evolving my setup. So one of the other things I ended up getting was a 35 millimeter pan optic for like, you know, a nice two inch wide field of view, but it added a lot more weight to the nose. So then I had to add a counter weight to the back end of the Dobsonian and and uh, the nice thing with the Dobbs is it's pretty easy to come up with some counterbalance solutions like that um, because there's such a huge physical, you know, object that you can, you know, just strap on other weights or things to, to, you know, achieve the balance that you need. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that is, that is neat. Huh? Yes. Yeah, so you went to something like that pretty, pretty quick. It, I, I upgraded, I bought a 30 millimeter wide scan three, which I've talked about before. Um, but that's not very heavy, really. Yeah. Yeah. That one's pretty light, pretty light. Yeah. Yeah. So what else, what other, so, what other kind of upgrades? Yeah. The, the other thing I did, like you kind of mentioned, um, you know, I'm like, because I'm a little taller that bending over kind of killed my back and, and what I was finding over periods of time or, or multiple observing sessions was that. I, I wasn't tired, but I was ending my session because my back couldn't take it anymore. You know, being crunched over, uh, the, the, you know, eight inch Dobsonian, which is kind of low to the ground. Uh, so I made myself an observing chair, which we've talked about too in previous episodes, but, um, a, a common one that you can make is it's called the Denver observers chair. Uh, so if you do an internet search for that, you'll find plans to build one. Um, and if you have some scrap lumber in your garage or, or, uh, you know, you probably would need a saw as well, but you can put one of these together for, for not a lot of money. And, uh, that was a real game changer. Um, the Denver observers chair allows you to adjust the height of the chair so that it can kind of match, you know, the angle of your telescope. So you're always in a comfortable seated position and, uh, it folds up so that, you know, it's very transportable. And, um, I tell you, it saved my back and it added hours onto my observing. Um, I've, I never would leave without that thing. Uh, it, it always came with me and it was just a, it, it's an essential part of my kit. Um, now that I'm a refractor observer, um, you know, sometimes the chair doesn't come out if it's going to be a short session, I can just stand and, you know, uh, deal with it. But if it's going to be any kind of a lengthier session or, uh, you know, I think an underappreciated part of a chair is if you really want to do critical observing, you know, particularly with the planets, just being seated, I think allows you to see a little bit more because you're yeah. just more comfortable at the eyepiece. And uh, so a chair is another big upgrade for me that uh, I'm glad I did it. And, I'll, you know, I will always have an observing chair as a result. 
Yeah. And I, that was one thing I, I recently bought, although uh, I just haven't used mine yet. Just haven't had, uh, haven't had the opportunity. My sessions around the house can be fairly, fairly short if they're not planet sessions. And since I bought it, the planets haven't been up. Um, but then once we get into uh, deep sky, dark sky observing uh, again, I'll, I'll be uh, taking that along uh, with me. But one of the other things that, that we did together, and I should say we did it together, but it was, it was more you than me that figured out all the nuts and bolts of it was uh, making those observing, uh, eyepiece cases. That was pretty cool. Yeah. You know, and, and of all the accessories in this hobby, um, the, the most frustrating one for me is eyepiece cases. Yeah. You buy, you know, you buy all of these eyepieces and, and maybe red lights and, you know, if you're a sketcher, you have pencils and, you know, all sorts of stuff that, that you need for, for doing your drawings. Um, it's, it's coming up with a nice way or a nice solution to transport all of that to the vehicle, to your observing site, whatever it is, um, so that you're not, you know, fumbling with five different, you know, things in your arms. Um, and, but it, you know, it, it transports all of the gear that you need. And eyepiece cases, you can buy like prefabbed ones, like, you know, Orion used to, maybe they still do, uh, sell cases that, you know, it, it depends if you have inch and a quarter or two inch eyepieces, you can buy different sized cases, but in almost every case, uh, no pun intended, um, uh -huh. it didn't meet my needs, you know, like it, it sort of accommodated some of my gear, but not all of my gear. So I remember you and I were having some discussions about that and you were doing a bunch of research and found that a uh, there's a, a pretty active cloudy nights thread about eyepiece cases. And what some people were doing was just going to a hardware store, um, buying like a toolbox, but then, uh, using like plexiglass or wood, they would create their own inset, just drill inch and a quarter or two inch holes into the plexiglass or into the, into the wood. And then, you know, you could kind of customize the case for whatever gear you had. But the real cool thing with what some of these people were doing uh, was they would put like a, a, some red LED lights in there um, on a switch. So then what we did uh, on our cases is we got a little potentiometer um, and then a, a strip of LED uh, lights uh, and a switch that would, so all of this would operate on a nine volt battery. I think, I think I had to put a resistor or two in there to, you know, balance everything, but um what was really cool with that is when we got out to our dark sites, you know, you'd flip open the lid and you can't see inside your eyepiece case because it's too dark, but we would just flicker, you know, the little switch, the potentiometer would allow us to adjust the brightness. So it wasn't, you know, blinding. Um, and then, you know, you had, you know, easy access to all of your eyepieces and, and those kits worked pretty good. Actually. I, I kind of liked it. Yeah, they did. I think I went with a, a size that was a little too large though. Just oh, like okay. I I still store some stuff in it, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, like I bought one that was almost ridiculously large, I think. So I probably should have gone with a size about half that size. And, and then, cause I find when we go observing, I'm, I'm only taking four or five eye pieces and that thing, when I loaded it up, I mean, it probably weighed 10 or 15 pounds and then it was big. So I'm like at, at the time too, I just had a small car. I have a bigger vehicle now. And, uh, anyway, regardless though, it's, it's a pretty big heft to haul it out. And then, uh, you know, I kind of had to use it out of the vehicle. Like you weren't really taking it out and, uh, maybe like, I didn't want to put it on my little, uh, observing table cause it would basically cover the whole table. And I, I don't know, I'm still, I'm still kind of working. I'm working out the eyepiece kinks still in, in my system. So I kind of hope when I get my Brilla back tripod with Trey that, you know, I'll just haul them out in my soft case and then just throw them on the tray. That's kind of my yeah. plan for now. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good plan. Yeah. I, I still struggle a little bit with this. Um, what I've migrated to now is just using your standard Pelican cases with the pluck foam and, and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. but, but rather than trying to put all of my eye pieces into one kit, um, you know, I have like kind of a wide field kit and then I have like a more planetary high contrast kit. So, um, you know, I, I take what I need for the, that moment in time. Um, but the other thing too, that simplifies things when it comes to, you know, eyepieces is, is just getting a, a good zoom eyepiece. Um, you know, if you can live with that, 
uh, it really simplifies what you need to take out into the field and, yep. you know, reduces the need for, you know, a crazy case. But um, yeah, I, I, you know, I still don't think I found the perfect eyepiece case or one that I'm super happy with. So yeah, uh, one thing though, that I will say that I really, really like about like Pelican cases or Nanook or whatever case you're, you're choosing um, it, it's that you can now, like you can put a, like a shoulder strap on and it just, it, it's kind of nice when I'm taking the gear outside, you know, it's one less trip indoors. Cause I can, you know, mule myself up to carry it a, a little bit easier. <laughs> um, and maybe one other comment just about these cases is, um, if you're going with like a foam case, I, I really recommend you get like one of the better ones, like a Pelican or a Nanook, or, you know, I'm sure there's a couple other brands out there. And the reason I say that is the cheaper cases uh, with the cheaper foam, uh, that foam gases, like it, it's, it's emitting some kind of gas, you know, from its production. And yeah. you can tell those cases, like as soon as you open it up, you can smell the foam. Um, yeah. Whereas like a Pelican or, or again, a Nanook, uh, you don't, you don't smell that. And um, I don't know if there's like conclusive data or proof. Uh, but there is certainly speculation uh, amongst astronomers that that off-gassing from foam probably isn't good for the coatings on your eyepieces and your diagonals and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I, you know, for those reasons, I, I say if you're if you're going pluck foam, get a good one. Even if that doesn't happen, so so I I think maybe that does happen. Um, but even if that doesn't happen, so I bought. Um, a really inexpensive case with pluck foam and uh, the pluck foam actually started to deteriorate. Yeah. So it kind of was like coming apart and I was like getting that in eye pieces and stuff. So I had to stop using that case. That was around yep. the time that we built these cases. Um, so that wasn't great either. Right. Cause you know, like you're, you're, you're pulling out eye pieces and then you're having like these little granulars of, of plastic and that around, which is never great either. So anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I do like the Pelicans because of the protection that they provide. Eyepieces will become for most amateurs will become a fairly significant portion of their investment. And, uh, as such, you know, I want to protect mine. And, and when we're traveling, like, especially camping, you know, you're, you're putting a lot of stuff in your vehicle and I just like the peace of mind knowing that I can put my eyepieces anywhere in the vehicle. Um, and it doesn't matter if they bounce around. It doesn't matter if they're underneath a whole bunch of other gear. Uh, they'll be fine, you know, because these yeah. cases, uh, they're almost bomb proof. So that's, yeah. uh, that's another reason why I like them. Yeah. And where we go, I mean, we go over some rough, we go over some rough terrain. So, I mean, if people are wondering maybe why we are so fixated on maybe getting things set up just, just the right way, like, you know, in some of the roads that we go down, they'll have washboard, like, I mean, holy cow, like six or eight inch washboard for, for hundreds of meters at a time. And then like, you know, right before our observing site, um, you know, like really, really rough roads, um, the roughest that I've ever driven on. So, I mean, I even have special tires for driving (laughs) specifically, bought for driving on those roads. Um, I'll put it that way. And although that might seem ridiculous, um, that's what I use my vehicle for. So, you know, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. And even my, even my local site here, like I'm starting to use it more now because it's extremely rough. Like that road is crazy rough. And, uh, and I feel like, oh, it's no problem. Like now that I have uh, proper tires for driving in, in really rough roads. And then the other thing is, you don't want to get stuck. So there, there's mm-hmm. an upgrade. I, I didn't even yeah. intend to say that. <laughs> I, I upgraded the wheels on my vehicle to, uh, to uh, I forget what they're called. They're, uh, I think they're a Bridgestone all-terrain tire. And then I got uh, rally rims from, uh, oh, uh, Le Chute Automotive over in uh, Quebec. So an- another plug for, for another Quebec retailer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So what else, Chris, what else is on the, uh, upgrade list? Well, I'll tell you, there's one now we don't own, we don't own reflectors, but for those that, that do own, uh, larger reflectors, um, is the Paracore by Teleview. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think a great, great upgrade, not inexpensive. I don't know what they cost now, 
Um, but they're, they're probably going to run at least three or $400, maybe even used. Um, but those paracord twos, I know Mike has one and he always uses it in his 12 inch. I think his 12 inches like F49 or F5. And that turns it into about an F5.7, which is a, so what, what the paracord does is in the reflectors, you have what's called coma and it's just an inherent uh, optical some may say it's a, it's a defect, but it's not. It's sort of part of the design of the Newtonian. So it's really just like an artifact that people are trying to get rid of. Um, and the paracord does a, does a wonderful job adjusting for that. Turns it almost into like refractor light views, uh, some might say. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the, uh, the other is that it increases the, the focal length by a little bit. So I think if you have an F five, you're turning it into like an F seven or something like that. And what that does, it does this great thing is that, so typically in an F five, you're not typically going to use like a 40 millimeter eyepiece. Not typically you might, um, but your exit pupil is going to get big and that's going to cause problems with the secondary shadow. And it's also going to cause problems because you're, you're losing some of, some of the aperture. Um, but when Mike puts that in, like, we'll take my 40 millimeter and we'll, we'll put that in his, uh, reflector. And I think he even bought a, but an older, uh, Teleview, uh, 40 millimeter wide field for it. Um, and so it becomes a much more, uh, viable, uh, instrument for having some, some different lower power eye pieces. Um, and then as well, it, it seems to remove virtually all of that uh, coma in the outer field. So you're able to really take advantage of those nice wide fields. Now, on, on the downside of that, it is expensive. And this is really only going to work in probably in the larger uh, Dobsonians, like uh, like 10 inches and up. But that's typically where you're going to use it once you get into F ratios of F5 or F4.5 or F4. Um, and I think they, they even work quite well down to F3, I've, I've read. Um, so that's, there's, there's an upgrade for people that are using uh, reflectors. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing too, with the paracore is uh, they're tunable. So depending on the eyepiece that you're using, right. there's a, there's a setting on the paracore that, that you'll, you know, change. Um, so it really allows, like it really improves the view uh, through fast uh, reflectors, um, no matter what eyepiece you're using. Um, and they are awesome. I never owned one. And um, you know, my, my reflectors were, I think F6 and F5. And mm -hmm. um, you know, I never, I never really felt the need, even with the F5, but, uh, you know, looking through reflectors that are like, you know, F4, uh, or, you know, anything faster than F5, I, I, th I think it's almost like you, you need it. Like you have to have a paracord or else the view just, uh, really, you know, it's not as good as it should be. And, um, you know, anything that we're doing out here, we're trying to get the best view possible. So, uh, a paracord would be high on my list if I had a, a fast reflector. So I see you, you've added a, a bit of a list there of uh, looks like finders, focusers, vibration. Anyway, do you want to talk about that stuff a little bit for upgrades? Yeah. So some, some of this stuff here is maybe less apparent, um, you know, and, and there's maybe even a couple categories here. Like we're talking a lot about just buying more gear uh, to improve your observing session. Um, but there's also just like improving what you have with some minor tweaks um, one of the best examples of that, that we've talked about on this podcast is Phil with his, uh, Celestron first scope that he's turned into a super mod. He calls it the super mod 76. Um, so you can do all sorts of tweaks to just make your equipment work better. And some mm -hmm. of those are like flocking the tube. Um, so you, you put like almost like a felt on the inside of your optical tube, which helps control, uh, like stray light from bouncing around. Yep. Um, you can sometimes replace the grease in moving parts, like you know, in your mounts or sometimes maybe focusers, uh, because the grease that often comes from the manufacturer just doesn't work good in cold temperatures. And, um, you know, that, that can improve your operation. Um, you know, just about any telescope, there's a collimation aspect to it. Now reflectors are needing it the most, but just ensuring you're well collimated is kind of a good upgrade to your, your system that you're, you're trying to do. Um, but, um, you know, some other things, uh, what we, so, you know, you're talking about your Borg and, uh, possibly, you know, using risers, uh, to accommodate, you know, um, larger diagonals, but risers can also make your finder just more comfortable to use. 
Again, mm-hmm. if you if you've got like a Telrad mounted right on your optical tube, you have to get down to that level to look through it. So if you can raise that up a few inches, that can just make it easier to look through and more comfortable. Um, what else do I have here? Focusers like uh, the focuser that came. You know, just about every telescope I think I've bought now in reflection, I've replaced the focuser because. You know, I either want it like with my, uh, my mead light bridge at the time, I don't know what they come with now, but it was just a single speed rack and pinion. So I put a dual speed, uh, Crayford focuser on there. Yeah. Um, my Skywatcher 120 ED, same thing, single speed focuser, put a dual speed rotating focuser on there. Um, so, you know, there's, there's lots of things you can do there. Yeah. And I got a, I got to come in and just kind of, uh, echo what you're saying on the focuser. Like for me, um, you know, a huge, like your, your physical contact with the instrument is the focuser. I mean, primarily that's, that's what you're doing is you're, um, setting it up, but then you're getting stuff into focus. And I just, uh, think that getting the highest quality focuser really is, um, such a critical thing. Um, for example, you know, and, and I didn't realize this as much. I, I just kind of decided to, well, I, I think I didn't have much of a choice when I bought my Borg five inch apocromat, um, there were limited options. And one of the options was to go with this feather touch. And so, well, all right, you know, this is sort of my ultimate, uh, telescope and, uh, and it really is an amazing piece of gear. So I'll just, uh, suck it up and, and get the focuser. And I'll tell you, um, getting a really good focuser, whether it's like a feather touch or a moonlight. And I know there's a few other really high end focusers out there. Um, I just can't say, uh, enough good things about having, uh, a proper focuser on an instrument. It just really makes, uh, the world of difference. Um, for example, you know, we observe in cold weather and I would find that, um, my older telescopes, they would, um, you know, that the focusers would kind of stop working as well in colder weather, you know, like down minus 15 or so, uh, the feather touch just, you know, no problem at those, at those temperatures. Um, and then also like getting things in and out of them, just, just a really sweet piece of gear. Yeah. Yeah. They can make a real difference and, and improve again. Everything we do is to improve the observing, whether it's comfort or, or the, uh, clarity of the image that you're seeing. So, um, focusers definitely can, can, uh, kind of do both actually in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, some other things I've listed here, uh, and, and, you know, I think we're starting to get into uh, a little bit of a territory of like, you know, the, the need for some of this stuff probably is, is pretty low on most people's priority list, but you know, they, they do, they do help out a little bit. One of those is vibration suppression pads. I've got them. Um, you? Yeah, I've got them too. Uh, I do use them on occasion. They're so not, um, they're not like earth shattering in terms of like, you know, changing your experience, but they certainly can help. Um, if you're like on a wooden deck or something like yeah. that, I was just going to um, say on a deck you need like, so like I, I, what I do is, uh, is I just have them and, uh, I'll just put them out whenever I'm on my deck. Like it yeah. makes, it's the difference between observing, on the deck and uh, feeling like you're having a regular session, dealing with a little bit of vibration or uh, just like ending a session in frustration. Like yeah, the, yeah. the deck is just way too bouncy without them. Yeah. So, so vibration suppression pads, um, they, they're sold in sets of three and they're for tripods. So typically, you know, a reflector or sorry, a refractor or uh, like a casa grain or something like that. But they're, they're these little pucks, um, probably like three inches in diameter, roughly. And what they do is like, they're, they're sort of like a rubberish compound in the middle Mm -hmm. and it's meant to dampen or absorb vibration. Now, whether that's, you know, top up, top down or bottom up, like from the deck. Um, but they do make a little bit of a difference. And if you're, if you're having some issues with vibrations, they can help. Um, now don't expect vibration suppression pads to overcome, uh, like a wobbly mount or, uh, you know, a, a tripod that can't handle the weight you're putting on it. Cause yeah, they, they only, yeah, they only do so much. And like I say, it's not, it's not earth shattering, but it can certainly reduce dampening times and maybe in some cases eliminate vibration if you don't have a lot to start out with. Yep. Um, the nice thing with them is, is of all of the accessories available, they're one of the cheaper ones. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it's kind of easy to add to your kit and uh, use them when, whenever you may need them. 
Yeah. And they, they last, like, I can't remember. I bought mine. It's one of those, these are one of those things that um, sort of, they work as advertised. Um, typically it's something I'm using around the home. So I'm not taking them out observing with me. Um, that's, that's unnecessarily, if, if your mount doesn't work well on like soft earth um, somewhere, it, it, these are not going to improve that. But if, if you, if you have a wooden deck, like you were saying, Shane, and you get some, some more vibration there, you will almost hundred percent. Um, this, this is almost like a must have for like around the house observing for the time saying you're, when you're going to be on the deck. Um, and it's, they're also great because typically telescope stores get them in and then they can't move them for whatever reason. And so that's how I bought mine. I got mine for like $10 or 19 bucks, or I remember it was less than $20 years ago. And I think even knew they run like $29 Canadian or something. They are really cheap and they work just as advertised. Yeah. Yeah. They are, uh, they're nice to have. They're handy once in a while. Um, another thing that you and I just discovered in the past year is the, uh, the Bader click locks. Um, yes. I saw you know, that. I couldn't remember if you put it in there, or whether I did, cause I meant to, I think you put it in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They are, uh, they are really, really nice. Now, again, this is something, do you need it? Nope, not at all. Um, are they expensive? Un unfortunately they are. Um, but does it, does it really, um, improve your observing? And I can say in some cases it does. And, yeah. and, and the one that I'll talk about first here, um, cause I know you have some opinions on this too, Chris is, um, my, my, ba uh, my Bader prism, uh, came with a uh, helical focuser and there's three, uh, thumb screws to tighten like your eyepiece in there on the compression ring. Yep. And if you're doing planetary observing, you're probably going up and down. Like you're, you're, you're going through eyepieces like crazy. You know, you'll put in a wider field eyepiece maybe to start out with, and then you'll vary the focal length based on the seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and then there might even be, you know, taking the eyepiece out and trying different filters. Yeah. Um, having those three thumb screws is a real pain um, to, to tighten and loosen, tighten and loosen every time you're doing this. Mm -hmm. um, the Bader click lock you just rotate this thing like a quarter of a turn and that eyepiece is locked in there. And then if you want to unlock it, it's just a quarter turn the opposite direction. Uh, and, and the turn is the ring, like kind of the, like the, where the eyepiece would sit in, like the eyepiece holder, there's a ring around there. That's very easy to tighten uh, or loosen. And um, it just makes swapping gear so much easier um, at the, uh, at the eyepiece level. And like, it locks really tight as well. Like you're not going to ever lose anything like, you know, falling out of the eyepiece or, you know, sometimes just with like the single thumb screw compression ring, I've had diagonals that I thought were tight in a telescope yeah, and, they rotate. and yeah. discover they're not right. And all of a sudden the whole eyepiece just flips upside down and thank goodness the diagonals never come out of the telescope. But, you know, I've had that happen a couple of times where, you know, if you're using a beta click lock, you're just not going to have that happen. Yeah. And I'll tell I'll tell you, it's one of those things where the photos and people's experiences don't quite, um, portray what, what it actually does. Um, it's difficult to describe, but, but the usability of it is remarkable. Um, I, I bought it because I wanted to turn a tack focuser from one and a quarter to two inch. And I found out that, that you could do this just by threading this on. And uh, so that's the only reason why I bought it. I didn't buy it for, for the reasons that we're kind of uh, saying it, it excels at, but, uh, but yeah, once I got it on there, it just thread it on. I thought it was going to be futzy to get on. It was nothing just like threading on a filter. And then uh, once it was on there, it just uh, worked so beautifully. Um, yeah. Just, just an excellent product, but yeah, I don't know how, how difficult it would be to, to meet with other telescopes, but I see people have them on all kinds of uh, different gears. So I think if you go to Bader's site, uh, they, they have a pretty good uh, explanation there of, of what you need. It's one of those things, like this becomes extremely particular to your exact diagonal or telescope type and brand and all these kind of things. But uh, but Bader's pretty good at walking through. And I'm sure if you wrote them an email, they'd, they'd tell you what you need. Yeah, yeah, they do make them for just about any telescope I think that exists. So um uh, yeah, you can find whatever you likely would need. 
Um, some of the inserts you don't have to worry about, like they do have the two inch to inch and a quarter adapter that would just sit inside your focuser or diagonal. Yeah. Um, you know, that will work in any, you know, anything, but if, uh, if it's something that threads on, yeah, make sure you get the one that, uh, is compatible with your gear. Yeah. All right. Now I want to touch on binoculars. <laughs> Go for it. Cause I think that is one of the, uh, best places where, where people can really, uh, get a good bump by realizing an upgrade. Um, you know, I see, you know, a lot of people who, uh, kind of my astronomy class will, will have access to a pair of binoculars. And then, um, typically I recommend getting a, a Pentax or a Nikon. I think that the Nikons are, are more affordable now and, and more readily available than the Pentax are. Um, but I definitely recommend the Nikon action extremes, uh, in particular, the eight by forties. So if people just have uh, a kicking around pair that they're kind of using, I definitely think to go to a Nikon eight by 40, I think they're around $200 Canadian, not inexpensive, but we are talking about upgrades. If, you know, if, if you're looking for something and then as well, I think uh, once you get beyond that, uh, taking a look at the uh, Canon image stabilized binoculars, I know that that's the route you have, you have gone and that I hope to follow one day. Yeah, yeah, the the Canon image uh, stabilized ones are really, really good. Um, no complaints there at all. Um, and the the only the only kind of like warning I would issue is once you use IS or image stabilized binoculars, it's pretty hard not to use any. Like you you will you will reach for those above anything else all of the time. They just they're so good, and they kind of make you a lazy binocular observer because you almost forget how to hold non-stabilized binoculars but um yeah they're all they're awesome can't say good enough good things about them yeah i have tried some of these zeiss and swarovskis as well they're pretty amazing um but just that that uh, stabilization feature like in the 12 and 10 and and 15 power cannons uh is pretty remarkable yeah yeah they're really really nice for sure yeah so do you have any uh, big upgrades that you plan to do uh, this year, Shane? Or I know we've kind of bought some gear over, over the past year and kind of starting to settle into to what I have now, just kind of fine tuning some things. But uh, what about you? Um, you know, similar to you, I've got a Burlaback tripod on my list. Um, it's not something that's needed. And, and uh, you know, I don't know how much of an upgrade it will be, but um, it would be nice uh, in particular uh, the tray, the eyepiece tray, you talked about that yep. earlier. Um, I think, you know, I have used tripods with trays and it is just so much nicer to have that. Um, you know, I've mentioned a bino viewer. I'm not sure if that's really an upgrade or, or just like new capabilities, but, um, you know, that's on my list. Um, and that might be about it actually. Um, nothing else stands out too much in my mind. You know, I'm going to get this, uh, Tasco 76, uh, millimeter, a classic telescope up and running here too. Um, and I've, you know, I'm upgrading the focuser and some rings. Um, but anyway, nothing, uh, nothing really stands out as too significant. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at upgrading my 30 millimeter old wide scan, probably get a Massiama 32 millimeter eventually. I think, I think they're basically the same thing. Um, I just want the new coatings and, uh, and an eyepiece that hasn't been rolling around an eyepiece case for three or four decades. And <laughs> then um, the other is, uh, I wouldn't mind upgrading my filters. You know, filters tend to, um, the optical services tend to wear after some time to gain uh, the better part of 20 years on my filters, um, nebula filters. So probably, probably time to do that. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. You know, there's, there's always, something right <laughs> it just seems that way that there's always something you can upgrade or enhance so it's kind of one of the fun things of the hobby but um you know something i need to balance because i can get out of hand sometimes too <laughs> yeah and usually once i get out under the stars i don't even think about any of this stuff that much <laughs> no for honest. sure i just yeah, then it's just observing. you're observing yeah exactly yeah. yeah no very cool anything else to add shane no that's everything chris yeah well with that i'll thank you and wish you a good day yeah, you as well. Thanks. Thank you everyone for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com.